General, uh, gentlewoman yields back. Uh, without objection, all other opening statements will be included in the record. We will now introduce today's uh, witnesses. Mr. Garrett O'Boyle. Mr. O'Boyle is a whistleblower, an FBI special agent, most recently in the Wichita Resident Agency of the Kansas City Field Office. Prior to becoming an FBI agent, Mr. O'Boyle served our nation as an infantryman uh, in the United States Army for six years. In the Army, Mr. O'Boyle was deployed to both Iraq and Afghanistan. He received numerous service awards, including the Combat Infantryman uh, Badge. Mr. O'Boyle received an honorable discharge from the Army. Upon leaving, Mr. O'Boyle continued his commitment to public service, serving as a police officer in Waukesha, Wisconsin for four years. Mr. O'Boyle joined the FBI in 2018. As an FBI agent, Mr. O'Boyle was selected to serve on the Joint Terrorism Task Force and the SWAT team. Mr. O'Boyle graduated cum laude from Marquette University with a degree in criminology and law studies. But the FBI questions his loyalty to the Constitution and to our country. Mr. Friend is a whistleblower and FBI special agent, most recently in the Daytona Beach Resident Agency of the Jacksonville Field Office. Prior to becoming an FBI agent in 2014, Mr. Friend served as a police officer in Savannah, Georgia, and Pooler, Georgia. And as an FBI agent, Mr. Friend spent seven years working human trafficking investigations and investigating crimes against children. Prior to blowing the whistle in 2022, Mr. Friend had received several awards from the FBI for his performance. Mr. Friend is a graduate of the University of Notre Dame. And again, after this service to our country, the FBI questions his loyalty to the country. Mr. Allen is a whistleblower and staff operations specialist with, an FBI, with the FBI Charlotte Field Office. Mr. Allen served 20 years of, has 20 years of experience as an intelligence professional in the FBI and the United States Armed Services. Prior to joining the FBI, Mr. Allen served in the United States Marine Corps, including service in Iraq, Kuwait, and Japan. In the Marines, Mr. Allen received several awards, including the Navy and Marine Corps Commendation Medal and the Navy and Marine Corps Achievement Medal. Mr. Allen received an honorable discharge from his Marine Corps duty. And again, the letter we got from the FBI, they're questioning his commitment to our country. I find that astounding. Prior to blowing the whistle, Mr. Allen received several awards from the FBI, including being selected as Employee of the Year for the Charlotte Field Office in 2019. Mr. Allen holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from American Military Uni University. Mr. Tristan Levitt. Mr. Levitt is an attorney and the president of Empower Oversight, an organization dedicated to enhancing independent oversight of government and corporate wrongdoing. Prior to joining Empower Oversight, Mr. Levitt was a Senate-confirmed member of the United States Merit System Protection Board, which adjudicates whistleblower retaliation claims. Mr. Levitt also served as the principal deputy special counsel at the Office of the Special Counsel, which enforces federal whistleblower laws. Earlier in his career, Mr. Levitt was a counsel for Senator Grassley on the Senate Judiciary Committee and staffer on the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee. He's a graduate of Brigham Young uh, University and Georgetown University Law Center and is considered an expert on the whistleblower law. As far as I know, the FBI hasn't questioned his loyalty to the country. It's just we welcome our witnesses and thank them for appearing today. We will begin by swearing you in. Would you please uh, stand and raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm under penalty or perjury, or penalty of perjury that the, the testimony you are about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief, so help you God? Let the record show that each witness answered in the affirmative. Uh, thank you. Please be seated. Please know that your written testimony will be entered into the record in its entirety. Accordingly, we ask that you summarize your testimony in approximately five minutes. We're going to give you plenty of time. Uh, but if you can keep it around five, great. But if you go over, no, 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 no worries there. Um, and we will start with Mr. O'Boyle. Uh, Mr. O'Boyle, you're recognized for your opening statement. Chairman Jordan, members of the committee, thank you for addressing FBI malfeasance and allowing me to speak today. Aside from that point of gratitude, I'm sad. I'm disappointed and I'm angry that I have to be here to testify about the weaponization of the FBI and DOJ. Weaponization against not only its own employees, but against those institutions and individuals that are supposed to protect the American people. I am here today because even though I am wrongfully suspended from the FBI, I remain duty bound to the American people to play my small role in rectifying these issues. After all, I never swore an oath to the FBI. I swore an oath to the Constitution. I've served my nation and community my entire adult life, first in the United States Army, then as a police officer, and lastly as an FBI special agent. 
Shortly after high school, I joined the United States Army where I served in the infantry and I was quickly promoted through the ranks. I deployed to both Iraq and Afghanistan in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom. I served in the historic 101st Airborne Division. I received the Combat Infantryman's Badge, which is awarded to those infantrymen who engage in ground combat with our nation's enemies. The Army's official motto is, this will defend. Along with numerous others, I volunteered to serve this nation, risking my life in combat to protect America and her values. I know some of the best men and women this country has to offer. They come from all backgrounds, races, and creeds. They helped mold me into the person I am today. Each was willing to sacrifice, and many did, to protect this great nation. It is our duty to honor their sacrifices by standing up for what is right, regardless of the difficulty. After serving in the Army, I became a police officer. Police officers, like me, are imperfect beings, but we strive to uphold the law and the Constitution. People who go to work every day trying to make their communities better, yet who nonetheless are faced with budget cuts and calls for defunding as we continue spiraling away from law and order as a nation. While serving as a police officer, I finished my bachelor's degree graduating with honors in criminology and law studies. Shortly thereafter, I began the long road to becoming an FBI special agent, a position I once understood to be the pinnacle of law enforcement and a way to continue to serve this nation and protect and defend the Constitution. During my four years as a special agent, I received the highest annual review an employee can receive. I volunteered for, tried out for, and was selected for an FBI SWAT team. I also volunteered for, tried out for, and was selected for a new unit the FBI created. I also received an award for my work on an anti-abortion extremism case. I've been smeared as a malcontent and subpar FBI employee. This smear stands in stark contrast to my life in public service. This smear campaign, disgusting as it is, is unsurprising. Despite our oath to uphold the Constitution, too many in the FBI aren't willing to sacrifice for the hard right over the easy wrong. They see what becomes of whistleblowers, how the FBI destroys their careers, suspends them under false pretenses, takes their security clearances and pay with no true options for real recourse or remedy. This is by design. It creates an Orwellian atmosphere that silences opposition and discussion. We know what is right to do, yet we too often refuse to do what is right because of the difficulty and suffering it incurs. I couldn't knowingly continue on this path silently without speaking out against the weaponization I witnessed, even if it meant losing my job, my career, my livelihood, my family's home, and now my anonymity. It's up to members of this committee, current and former FBI employees, and indeed all Americans, to ensure that the weaponization of our own government against the people comes to an end, no matter the personal cost. As James Madison prudently opined, in framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed, and the next place, oblige it to control itself. The safeguards currently in place at the FBI are clearly inadequate and must be reworked to protect whistleblowers and others who are inappropriately targeted. The FBI can extract whatever they want from me. I'm willing to bear that burden. I've sworn to defend this country from enemies, both foreign and domestic, even if that means sacrificing my life. I've lived that oath out since first enlisting in the Army, consistently saying, here am I, send me. My oath, however, did not include sacrificing the hopes, dreams, and livelihood of my family. My strong, beautiful, and courageous wife, and our four sweet and beautiful daughters who have endured this process along with me. In weaponized fashion, the FBI allowed me to accept orders to a new position halfway across the country. They allowed us to sell my family's home. They ordered me to report to the new unit when our youngest daughter was two weeks old. Then, on my first day on the new assignment, they suspended me, rendering my family homeless. <clears throat> they refused to release our goods, including our clothes, for weeks. <clears throat> All I wanted to do was serve my country by stopping bad guys and protecting the innocent. To my chagrin, bad guys have begun running parts of the government, making it difficult to continue to serve this nation and protect the innocent. But I, for one, will never stop trying, and I'll never forget my oath. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Boyle. God bless you. Um, Mr. Friend, you're recognized for your opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Jorman. And members of the committee, my name is Stephen Friend. I'm a senior fellow for the Center for Renewing America. Prior to assuming my current position, I was a special agent for the Federal Bureau of Investigation for eight and a half years. During that time, I investigated approximately 200 violent crimes, such as aggravated assaults, murder, child abuse, rape, robbery, child molestation, child pornography, and human trafficking. I also served five years on an FBI SWAT team and spent five years as a local law enforcement officer in the state of Georgia. 
In August 2022, I made protected whistleblower disclosures to my immediate supervisor, assistant special agents in charge, and special agent in charge about my concerns regarding January 6 investigations assigned to my office. I believed our departures from case management rules established in the FBI's domestic investigations and operations guide could have undermined potentially righteous prosecutions and may have been part of an effort to inflate the FBI's statistics on domestic extremism. I also voiced concerns that the FBI's use of SWAT and large-scale arrest operations to apprehend suspects who were accused of nonviolent crimes and misdemeanors represented by counsel and who pledged to cooperate with the federal authorities in the event of criminal charges created an unnecessary risk to FBI personnel and public safety. At each level of my chain of command, leadership cautioned that despite my exemplary work performance, whistleblowing placed my otherwise bright future with the FBI at risk. Special agents take an oath to protect the U.S. Constitution. The dangers of federal law enforcement overreach were hammered home to me when I was required to attend trainings at the Holocaust Memorial Museum and MLK Memorial. I cited my oath and training in my conversations with my FBI supervisors. Nevertheless, the FBI weaponized the security clearance processes to facilitate my removal from active duty within one month of my disclosures. In addition to an indefinite unpaid suspension, the FBI initiated a campaign of humiliation and intimidation to punish and pressure me to resign. In violation of HIPAA, individuals at the FBI leaked my private medical information to a reporter at the New York Times. In violation of the Privacy Act, the FBI refused to furnish my training records for several months. To date, they only provide a portion of the records, which are essential to obtaining private investigator and firearms licenses in the state of Florida. Even after releasing some of the records, the FBI refuses to confirm their legitimacy to the Florida Department of Agriculture, rendering the few documents they have provided practically useless. The FBI denied my request to seek outside employment in an obvious attempt to deprive me of the ability to support my family. Finally, the FBI Inspection Division imposed an illegal gag order in an attempt to prevent me from communicating with my family and attorneys. Working as an FBI Special Agent was my dream job. My whistleblowing was apolitical and in the spirit of upholding my oath. Nonetheless, the FBI cynically elected to close ranks and attack the messenger. The FBI is incentivized to work against the American people and in dire need of drastic reform, particularly in these areas. The integrated program management system incentivizes the use of inappropriate investigatory processes and tools to achieve arbitrary statistical accomplishments. Mission creep within the national security branch has refocused counterterrorism from legitimate foreign actors to political opponents within our borders. The FBI weaponizes process crimes and reinterprets laws to initiate pretextual prosecutions and persecute its political enemies. Bureau intelligence analysis capability increasingly dictates operations, turning the FBI into an intelligence agency with a law enforcement capability. FBI collusion with big tech to gather intelligence on Americans, censor political speech, and target citizens for malicious prosecution. A dysfunctional promotion process fosters a revolving door of inexperienced, ambitious FBI supervisors ascending the management ladder within the agency. FBI informant protocols that are broken and abusive. The FBI skirts the Whistleblower Protection Act and exploits the security clearance revocation process to expel employees who make legally protected disclosures. I am pleased to see the Weaponization Committee is taking testimony from FBI whistleblowers. I would also like to take this opportunity to address correspondence recently received by the subcommittee. Yesterday, May 17, 2023, FBI Acting Assistant Director Christopher Dunham submitted a letter to this subcommittee. Portions of his letter concern the suspension and revocation of my security clearance. Parenthetically, I also received a letter from the FBI Ex Executive Assistant Director Jennifer Moore yesterday notifying me that my security clearance was revoked. I find the timing of these letters dubious, but leave that up to the subcommittee's determination. Instead, I would like to address the, and add vital context to the portion of Mr. Dunham's letter pertaining to my alleged violation of Adjudicative Guideline J. Mr. Dunham is referring to an audio recording I created of my August 23, 2022 meeting with Jacksonville Assistant Special Agents in Charge, Colt Markovsky and Sean Ryan. After making protected whistleblower disclosures to my immediate supervisor in August 19, 2022, ASAC Markovsky summoned me to a meeting at the FBI Jacksonville office. ASAC Markovsky told me the meeting was intended to be an opportunity to discuss my concerns. I anticipated the meeting might ultimately lead to my executive managers attempting to compel me to participate in an activity which placed public safety at risk. 
I was concerned ASEC Markovsky and ASEC Ryan may threaten adverse actions toward my career as a result of my whistleblower disclosure. Prior to the meeting, I consulted Florida law to confirm that a law enforcement exemption exists for state two-party consent restriction. I decided to record the meeting to memorialize our discussion and my concerns about the FBI's misconduct. When I entered the FBI Jacksonville office building, ASEC Markovsky and ASEC Ryan were having a private meeting. I waited for them in a conference room. When they entered, all of us placed our cellular phones on the conference table. As an experienced investigator who has conducted hundreds of recorded interviews, I noted how both ASEC Markovsky and ASEC Ryan repeated themselves throughout our discussion and continually insisted I agree to their premise that I was insubordinate and refusing to perform my job. I rebuffed each allegation and repeated that I believed I was fulfilling my oath of office. By making my disclosure about the FBI's rule of departures and the inappropriate risk to public safety via aggressive arrest tactics for January 6 subjects. It was my sincere belief that my ASACs were also recording our conversations. In January 2023, I participated in an interview with the FBI Security Division. During that interview, I was asked if I recorded my August 23, 2022 meeting with ASAC Markovsky and ASAC Ryan. I answered honestly that I had. Although it would seem to be an obvious and natural follow-up, the FBI Security Division interviewers did not request a copy of the recording. FBI Security Division should be gravely concerned if executive managers threaten subordinate whistleblowers with adverse action. I submitted that this omission by the FBI Security Division solidifies my contention that ASACs, Markovsky, and Ryan created their own recording of our meeting. The FBI was not concerned about potential whistleblower retaliation. The Bureau was only interested in learning if these actions were at risk of exposure. I pray that all members consider the information I and my fellow whistleblowers present. You may think I'm a political partisan. You may think I am a grifter. You may think I'm a conspiracy theorist. It does not matter. Simply put, this committee should avoid te the temptation to impugn the character and the motivations of the messengers seated before you. I sacrifice my dream job to share this information with the American people. I humbly ask all the members to do your jobs and consider the merit of what I have presented. Thank you, Mr. Friend. I appreciate uh, your testimony. Mr. Allen, you are now recognized for your opening statement. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, hello, my name is Marcus Allen. I'm a staff operations specialist for the FBI in the Charlotte Field Office. Uh, due to whistleblower retaliation by the FBI, I've been suspended without pay for over a year. Uh, thank you to the committee for allowing me time today to convey my concerns about the current FBI. In particular, I am concerned, and I believe this committee should also be concerned about the FBI's use of the security clearance process to retaliate against whistleblowers. First, though just so you know a little bit about me, I served honorably in the United States Marine Corps from 2000 to 2005. I was deployed to Kuwait and served two tours in Iraq and contributed to Operation Iraqi Freedom. During my deployments, I was exposed to live enemy fire on numerous occasions even though I served primarily in analytical and intelligence roles. I was awarded the Navy and Marine Corps Commendation Medal and the Navy and Marine Corps Achievement Medal. I eventually joined the FBI and was Employee of the Year in 2019 in the Charlotte Field Office. As the holder of a top secret security clearance since 2001, I've been trusted with the nation's greatest secrets. So why am I here today? Despite my history of unblemished service to the United States, the FBI suspended my security clearance accusing me of actually being disloyal to my country. This outrageous and insulting accusation is based on unsubstantiated accusations that I hold conspiratorial views regarding the events of January 6, 2021, and that I allegedly sympathize with criminal conduct. I do not. I was not in Washington, D.C. on January 6, played no part in the events of January 6, and I condemn all criminal activity that occurred. Instead, it appears that I was retaliated against because I forwarded information to my superiors and others that questioned the official narrative of the events of January 6. As a result, I was accused of promoting conspiratorial views and unreliable information. Because I did this, the FBI questioned my allegiance to the United States. Since I was suspended, there's been a dearth of communication from the FBI, with interactions seemingly only being forced by actions from my counsel or members of Congress. For example, I was not even interviewed, interviewed by anyone from the FBI until May of 2022. 
I was suspended in January of 2022. This interaction with the FBI happened on the heels of a public statement from a congressional member in early May of 2022. The member made statements indicating the FBI was conducting a purge of employees with conservative viewpoints. Within hours of the public statements, my counsel received a phone call from the FBI wanting to see if they could conduct an interview. I promptly complied and did an interview with investigators within a week. Throughout this ordeal, I and my counsel have responded quickly, whereas the FBI has only stonewalled. I have filed a federal civil rights lawsuit, which is pending, seeking to recover my livelihood and restore my good name. Recently, my counsel filed a whistleblower complaint with the Justice Department's Office of Inspector General. The complaint set forth retaliation through misuse of the security clearance process, as well as reprisal against me for making a protected disclosure. Interestingly enough, in the wake of the filing, the complaint I in the wake of filing the complaint, I received correspondence from the FBI indicating that my clearance had now been formally revoked. This occurred after filing my complaint with the IG. The new and baseless claims made in the letter had never been brought up prior to the issuance of the security clearance revocation letter. I have never had the opportunity to defend myself. I only had one interview with the FBI, which occurred a year ago after apparent prompting from Congress. In that interview, the investigators towards the end of the interview uttered in response to my exasperation, don't sue us. This has been a trying circumstance for me and my family. It has been more than a year since the FBI took my paycheck from me and we're getting financially crushed. My family and I have been surviving on early withdrawals from our retirement accounts while the FBI has ignored my request for approval to obtain outside employment during the review of my security clearance. We have lost our federal health insurance coverage and there's apparently no end in sight. I'm hopeful scrutiny from Congress and from the Inspector General will deter the FBI from abusing the security clearance process to retaliate against others the way it's retaliated against me. This is why I filed a whistleblower retaliation complaint with the IG and why I'm here today to answer your questions. Thank you. And I also have a rebuttal if the member will allow me to, thank you. This is a rebuttal of the FBI correspondence just recently sent to the committee in reference to my clearance suspension and now revocation. Calumny is not a word to be thrown around lightly. In regards to the FBI's treatment of me, it is fitting. This is conduct on becoming of an organization given the public trust. Think about that. My treatment, without a doubt, has sent a chilling effect through what semblance remains of an analytical cadre. This was not a thorough investigation in my regard. I have not been afforded an opportunity to appropriately defend myself or confront the claims made against, made against me. Interestingly, the revocation language citing guideline E is the first instance I've ever seen referring to this specific guidance in my case. The claim that I obstructed a lawful investigation is dubious, and I do not recall ever being admonished for such an infraction. In regards to the paragraph in the letters highlighting an alleged incident with a special agent, I have no idea what it refers to. This alleged incident did not come up at all during the alleged thorough investigation. Again, as with guideline E, this is the first appearance of this allegation during this entire ordeal. Next, I do not recall ever receiving a directive to stop sending information in regards to the sixth. Why would you not want any more information sent to you? Furthermore, the September 29, 2021 email referred to in the letter is part of a protected disclosure, and this correspondence represents documentary evidence of a protected disclosure as a source of retaliation and reprisal. Alternative analysis and differing viewpoints should be welcomed, even though they may not be ultimately acted upon by the actual decision makers. Groupthink should not be an ethos championed in an investigative organization. To shut down differing viewpoints is the end of any analytical or investigative body. It sends a chilling effect across the workforce and does not allow for intellectual freedom, which is vital to any investigative body seeking out the truth. It is possible the ire towards my perspective could have been due to folks wanting to maintain vincible ignorance instead of consciously and mentally transferring over to willful ignorance. This is the end of my statement, and thank you for my time. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Mr. Levitt. Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Plaskett, and members of the subcommittee, thank you so much for the invitation to testify today. I currently serve as the president of Empower Oversight, 
We're honored to represent Stephen Friend and Marcus Allen. FBI whistleblowers have second-class status compared to those in most federal agencies. When Congress adopted the modern system of whistleblower protections, it prohibited retaliation against FBI whistleblowers. But it gave them none of the process that other federal law enforcement agencies received, like the DEA, the ATF, the U.S. Marshals, and Secret Service. Whistleblowers of those agencies can all file retaliation complaints with the U.S. Office of Special Counsel, an independent agency. FBI whistleblowers cannot. Whistleblowers at those agencies can all repeal retaliation to the Merit Systems Protection Board, on which I recently served. Until just last year, FBI whistleblowers could not. They finally got that right in last December's NDAA. But Congress must ensure that this new jurisdiction applies as intended to all FBI retaliation cases. Many have been wending their way for years through DOJ's long and extensive process. But the laws prohibiting retaliation have been on the books that entire time. The FBI cannot claim now that these are new rights just because they now have to justify their actions before the MSPB. Time has demonstrated, in my opinion, that it was a mistake to exclude the FBI from the standard whistleblower protection process. It discourages integrity and encourages deceit and even corruption. Congress should treat the FBI the same as all other federal law enforcement agencies, eliminating a special exception and giving its employees access to OSC to investigate retaliation. The hardworking of the employees of the FBI deserve equal protection of the law. The FBI's latest troubling practice is suspending security clearances to retaliate against whistleblowers. Mr. Friend and Mr. Allen, along with Mr. O'Boyle, are just several public examples of this trend. When the FBI suspends a clearance, it also immediately suspends the employee indefinitely, without pay. To make matters worse, it holds them and their families hostage by requiring them to get permission to take another job, permission the FBI routinely denies. Congress needs to ensure the FBI stops this abuse. In light of all these obstacles for FBI whistleblowers, you would think Congress would do everything that it could to welcome their disclosures here. But FBI employees coming to Congress have unfortunately been shamefully treated by Democrats on this committee. It's one thing to hear allegations and find them unpersuasive or even distasteful. An office can even ignore those allegations if they choose. That's their prerogative. But to go out and actively smear the individuals making disclosures is far worse. That's what the Democrats on this committee did when they released a March 2nd report entitled GOP Witnesses, What Their Disclosures Indicate About the State of the Republican Investigations. That report was inaccurate, both on the law and on the facts. The law doesn't define the term whistleblower. Instead, it protects from retaliation individuals who engage in protected activity. For over a century, simply making disclosures of any information to Congress has been a protected activity. Furthermore, an appropriations writer in effect at this time prohibits money from paying the salary of any federal employee who prohibits or prevents any other federal employee, such as FBI whistleblowers, from communicating with Congress. The Democrats' report denied whistleblower status to individuals engaged in the precise activity the legislative branch has considered protected since 1912. The report's reliance on evidence for whistleblower status is also misplaced. Simply communicating a reasonable belief of misconduct is protected whistleblower activity under the law. This applies regardless of whether the whistleblower produces evidence at that time backing up their allegations. Only protecting whistleblower disclosures accompanied by conclusive evidence, as the Democrats seem to require, would have disastrous consequences for retaliation throughout the federal government. My experience working for Congress was that whistleblowers brought allegations, and where the committees found those allegations worthy of further follow-up and congressional action, we conducted investigations. No one expects a private citizen to investigate a crime before going to the police, and we didn't expect a whistleblower to investigate their own agency. That's also essentially how the law for remedying retaliation through the MSPB is set up, where making a non-frivolous allegation leads to discovery, interviews, and more. Simply put, the burden isn't on the whistleblower to produce the evidence at the outset. That's why there's an investigative process. The Democrats' report also got the facts wrong. For example, they claim DOJ IG declined to investigate Mr. Friend's claim, when in fact DOJ IG will be interviewing Mr. Friend tomorrow and has an ongoing investigation. DOJ IG says no one from the Democrat staff ever contacted their office to verify this claim before issuing their report. Inexcusably, a number of mainstream media sources simply repeated the Democrats' wrong information uncritically without bothering to check the facts for themselves, which is why there were multiple retractions. FBI whistleblowers have traveled a hard road over the years. They should be treated by Congress the same as other whistleblowers. 
Issuing reports smearing those who come forward from the FBI will unquestionably deter others from taking that same path. Congress must have firsthand information about how federal agencies are operating to perform its constitutional duty of oversight. Why would future whistleblowers bring their disclosures to Congress if they think they might be treated like this? Attacking whistleblowers hurts this committee and others, the House of Representatives as an institution, and Congress as a whole. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Levitt. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Wyoming.